Good evening and welcome to the State of the ASA. I am Vicki Best and I serve as the Director of Operations and Development, also known as the DUDE, for the ASA. We're delighted that you're spending your evening with us and I trust it will be informative and we'll do our best to make it fun. I'm joining you live from the ASA Home Office in Topsfield, Massachusetts. And this is our 76th annual business meeting and our first ever virtual one. Many of us are used to racing into these meetings after having just played in a heated volleyball match or a competitive softball game. The ASA athletes are very competitive and I'm missing that in being with all you face to face. So I had to bring these in as symbols of the memories that we've had over the years. But our Summer Something series has been a huge success and it's been great seeing all of you online this week. When COVID became a reality this spring and our annual meeting was canceled, our team quickly pivoted and the Summer Something series was a creative way of bringing many elements of the annual meeting that we all love to this virtual pl platform. Now I'm gonna give you an overview of our meeting and review some of the housekeeping details. So our agenda will go like this. First of all, we will have the president's report. And then from there, we'll look at the executive council candidate for next year. Um, the leadership team will bring a report. We'll look at a financial overview. And then we'll move to the fellows class of 2020. We'll honor our 50 year members. And then we'll do our uh, remembrances to our members in glory. We'll take a look at our student chapter leaders and then we'll hear a student testimonial and a donor story. We'll talk about our upcoming meetings and then we'll move into a question and answer session and then we'll move to our ice cream social when it's all over. I want to remind you that you can submit questions through the Q&A button. Um, so please use the Q&A button and not the chat feature. The chat feature, though, we'd love for you to use, and I see many chats coming in, so feel free to be social and chat with one another, greet each other, and also please follow the ASA on Facebook and Twitter. Now I'm going to turn the floor over, or should I say the screen over, to John Wood, Executive Council President, who I see is sporting one of his famous Hawaiian shirts to go along with our theme tonight. Take it away, John. Thanks, Vicki. That's so great. I wasn't expecting the volleyball or the, the softball, so, uh, but you know that I'm going to be wearing a Hawaiian shirt. It's, uh, it is summer, and it's our summer something. So good evening, everyone. I'm certainly happy to be with you tonight. Um, we're going to have a, a good time, I think, together. And I'm happy to report that the state of the ASA is excellent. And, uh, and that is in this time kind of remarkable. This meeting is a sterling example and a testament to the robust health of the American Scientific Affiliation. You know, I've been scanning this participant list and, and watching the chats going up and down. I see uh, friends old and new showing up and um, my goodness, uh, the only thing we don't get to do, as Vicki said, is we don't get to run out and talk to one another, uh, you know, firsthand, but, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Dominic Halsmer reminded us in the, in the reflection on Wednesday, that God is so good to us, and there are so many good things. And so our glass is much more than, than uh, half full these days. Uh, and it is uh, a series of challenging times. I'm going to show you, you see on my report here, I've got uh, five different items there that I'm going to touch on. These are not normal times, and we all know that. And uh, that's not uh, remarkable to say at, at this point. Um, and the real question for us is, uh, Andy Crouch and the, the folks at Praxis have, have said, uh, are we in a winter storm? Uh, is this an entire winter season that we've fallen into? Or have we actually uh, dipped into an, a little new, um, a little ice age? Are we just in a new era here? And so we'll talk about that as we go forward, because uh, tonight certainly uh, are not uh, normal times. i to talk to you a little bit about mission and calling in the ASA. 
And that's the, there we go, thank you. As you can tell, this is our first attempt to, to do this and to figure out all of the, the uh, technical questions about how to move ourselves forward. The mission of the ASA, as uh, I think we all know and understand, is a long-standing one and has been reviewed and, uh, in fact, recently by the council just a few years ago. Let me just read that to you. The ASA's mission is to encourage the Christian church and the scientific community to discuss and to share discoveries and perspectives about science and the Christian faith while providing a community of fellowship for Christians involved in science and related fields. Now, your council is really thinking this through and has been, uh, we've begun conversations. We're not uh, certainly not done with those. We're at the front end of those. But I think there are three persistent elements that show up in our mission. And you, see, you hear it there. The first is, is discovery. You know, we've been known as being a, a mission or a, a, an issues organization, and it's uh, throughout our history, uh, reflecting deeply about creation in light of Scripture and, and feeling, uh, feeding that back to ourselves and to the larger community. Now, the second piece that shows up there is that we're not just discussing those issues, but we're providing a way of being a bridge a model in dialogue, reaching out in community and fellowship. And one of the things we did uh, as a leadership team was we said, uh, we can't do face-to-face -face meetings, but we can do something. And so here's the summer something that we're doing in order to maintain this community of relationships and interactions. And then the third feature out of our, our mission and our calling is really calling. It is supporting other Christians, one another, in our vocations, within what sometimes is called the STEAM disciplines or the STEM disciplines, or uh, you know, we, we have different ways of, of dividing all that up, but we have a broad mission uh, to men and women in the natural and social sciences and related areas. And so that mission is at our forefront. We're focused on that. And I want to talk to you a little about that uh, tonight. But I'll do that in a generational way. I think there's something interesting is happening as we've looked at ourselves over this last uh, six months or a year. I think we've discovered something. You're going to see tonight uh, that if you look at the ASA, we're almost 80 years old, and in eight decades, we've gone through multiple generations. The first generation of the founders, and in, in, the, in the 40s through the 60s, and you have the founding five, uh, if you look at um, Alton Everest's uh, book that's on our webpage, the American Scientific Affiliation, it's growth and early development. Uh, you see that, that we got our start in the boardroom at Moody Bible Institute when you know, five professors came together, primarily from Christian colleges and uh, across the country. And this is the early onset of what has become the evangelical movement that we see in maturity today. And so this group starts, the founding five, but no sooner are they started than they're interrupted. And that interruption pushed us out of the intention to have annual meetings into local chapter meetings. And the ASA has seen that happen this year. We've been pushed once again as we enter uh, this period of COVID chaos We've been pushed out of face-to-face -face meetings, and now we're taking advantage of modern technology to reach out and connect with one another, both nationally and in a... Just step back one slide, Mark. Thank you. So I just want to say there, there's something interesting going on here. If you see these founders, and you'll, some of you will recognize these individuals, and in particular, I want to just point out Erwin Moon, because Erwin Moon's sermons in science had some really powerful impact in reaching out to the, to the president of Moody and then to these five individuals. And he was really an important um, activator, not only in communicating to young people of the day about science. I saw some of his films as a, as a youngster in the 50s, and I'm sure many in the audience did. But not only that, but in, in activating 
being the energy of activation to get this organization ASA off. In the second generation, what you see here are individuals, and you'll notice here what I'm doing is that I'm putting up only individuals who have passed away. Uh, there are other individuals I could have included here in what I'm calling the builder phase in the 60s through the 80s. And by the way, I'm not a historian. Think of this as a kind of overlapping circles, if you like. It's, 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 a, it's a sliding kind of time scale. But we really started building as an organization. And individuals in particular, uh, uh, Dick Bube's work and Walt Hearn's work we know were essential to the structure of the organization. We get our first uh, part-time executive director, executive secretary actually, and we start moving forward. And then in the third generation, what you'll see is men who have now just recently, just this year, passed from the scene, and these I've been calling the consolidators, a period of time when we consolidated on our mission and we're doing and different things happen. I notice that we moved from uh, Illinois to Massachusetts. Uh, we had a fire that destroyed some records and, and we had some real challenges along the way that had to be met. And each of these individuals, you look at Jack Haas and his work with the, uh, as an editor, and there are other editors of the journal consolidating the power of that journal to move it, as Jim Peterson has told us, into a first rank academic journal uh, that, uh, that we can all be rightly proud of. Well, that's a generational shift, but now the question is for us. We stand here at the outset of the, the 21st century. We really are moving into that fourth generation. I'm a kind of bridge character because I really fit more in the third generation than I do in the fourth. I'm a digital immigrant. I'm not native to this, this uh, world that we're living in, and I've had to learn all. It doesn't mean that you can't teach the old dog new tricks, but still, uh, this, all of this technology, all of the kinds of things we have to do to be able to, to reach effectively. So we are faced with, with questions, but we're also faced with opportunities. And we have all of this to think about in terms of what will our mission look like today and what is, has it? So we've looked back, see what it is, and we're, we're going forward. So the, the real question comes out of this fourth generation and what your executive council is wrestling with are what we call meeting our elephants. This is coming out of a, a publication for, the, for board members from the uh, Evangelical Council of Financial Accountability. You'll hear a bit more about them later. And that council uh, has produced several books on best board practices. They're there as a kind of accrediting agency for us to help us uh, be a better board, um, which we know, uh, those of us who sit around the table, know that this doesn't just come naturally to academics and to people in government. You, you actually have to learn. There are some, some uh, uh, tools and uh, experiences and examples that we can learn from. And nonprofit management today is much more sophisticated than it was uh, 20 years ago, 30, 40, and certainly 80 years ago than it is today. So our elephants really line up in three different ways. We've got a strategic model that we're working with, and we're thinking that through, and that involves leadership and other questions. And we have a business model, and in COVID times, uh, trying to rationalize a business model as you'll hear about in our financial report later, is a, is a huge challenge for us. And we've been thinking deeply about that. And in fact, Summer Something is one example of what we're trying to do to recast our business model uh, to which annual meetings is such an important um, uh, component. And then finally, our leadership intent and our practices. So we're intending and we're improving our practices. Um, if you, if you know Jim Collins and the flywheel principle, we've turned that flywheel a couple of times and it's starting to pick up momentum and these various practices, we're getting better and better as we go on to that. And finally, the executive council, here's your executive council. And, and you notice that we're a mixed 
group here of five-year and three-year terms. That's reflecting our, our bylaws. And thank you, every one of these individuals. I have come to know them, and I'm getting to know the, the new members better now. Uh, we've already had, uh, what is it, one, two, three meetings with our, our new term members. So we had an extraordinary April council meeting. We had a board orientation uh, meeting with the, the, uh, the new first ever board orientation for new board members. And uh, we're getting to know one another. And we find that that is a, a vital practice that we must uh, bring in because we're no longer just located up in, in Topsfield. We're not just at Gordon College and at a few Eastern institutions. We're spread not only across the United States, but right across North America in our leadership, in our staff, in our management practice, in our guidance from our executive council. So this is the current executive council. And, um, and then I want to introduce to you, most of you already know Dominic Halsmer, and uh, Dominic's with us tonight. And um, here is, are his credentials. The nominating committee has met. It brought a report to the executive council um, and that the council considered that report and we're putting forward as has been our practice now for the last uh, four years, we're putting forward uh, Dominic uh, for the membership to vote and you'll see this is a snapshot, just a thumbnail sketch of his activity, service in the ASA, his research interests. A little shout out to his book, Hacking the Cosmos. Uh, there, uh, and um, we'll put the full details up online. We'll have a 30-day comment period, and then we'll have a voting period uh, that will follow that. Uh, that will come along here in the next month. Or so. so I'm going to just give you now. So that's my president's report. So now I've just taken off a virtual hat. I'm going to set that aside over here. And now I'm going to put on a, a different hat, and it's a hat, and I see Vicki smiling because it's, <laughs> this is a leadership team hat, and I am the interim executive director, and there are a number of things that have happened in this last year. I want to give you kind of the, the, the upper level 40,000 foot kind of thing, uh, just so that you see. First of all, you, just, to, uh, before, yeah, just before we go to that next slide, a number of things have happened in this last year. As you all know, we had a leadership transition. We ended the last year um, in, a, uh, uh, in a deficit place as well. That's another fiscal thing that uh, Vicki will talk about and how we have managed that. Uh, we had a leadership transition um, as Leslie moved on at APU to other opportunities there. Um, and so people are asking the question, you know, where are you going? Uh, and so the council, in its April meeting, made the decision that that the uh, that I would step in as the interim executive director. Sometimes interim is pretty short, but this is actually a full year's appointment, and we're in conversation about that. And so I know some of you are wondering what we're doing in terms of search, and we will be letting you know that uh, that has been on our agenda, um, and we're not ready to make a, an announcement about that. But you should know in terms of the state of the ASA, the executive committee, the council, pardon me, uh, your board is, is not, um, uh, it's confident in the, in the leadership team it has. And I, I, you know, I say that as a member of that team and, and confident in the direction that we're setting. And so uh, we're not in a, in a rush here to make decisions. Uh, and we're going to look at the kinds of things that we were talking about. Look at the elephants that we have to meet and come forward. Uh, your management team will come forward with that plan. What we've been doing, as you might imagine on COVID is, we had a, a nice budget set up in March. We'd been working on it in February and March. We had that already. And by the time the council met in March, we knew that that budget wasn't gonna work. We adopted it for a month to let the, the dust settle a bit and in April, the management leadership team came back with a report and we passed a revised and repositioned budget you'll hear about. Then we started into a number of other activities, a members assembly meeting, 
membership calls, summer something, trying to plan for the year. And as you, you can imagine, we're doing two tracks at once, like every nonprofit. We're trying to secure your staff, make sure that you have cash flow through the year and funding under you to keep this organization going. And so we've been working on that. And um, I just want to stop and say, it has been a joy this last four months. It's been the hardest work I think we've, we've done. Um, man, I just feel like I'm right back in the thick of it again. And it's been really good. And so thank you, Vicki, for doing that. I'm going to turn this over to Vicki and let her get into the details now of our leadership team report. Vicki? Thank you, John. You all need to know that I have a really hard time of keeping up with John. <laughs> uh, he keeps me on my toes, but like he said, it's been a real um, honor and privilege to work with him. So I'm going to uh, take you through a financial and operational overview now, uh, including highlights of the last year. I'm going to introduce a number of our staff members. We're going to look at member services and our local chapters, and then finally a financial update. So 2019-2020, uh, uh, we had a number of highlights, as you are aware our annual meetings have been on the rise in terms of attendance and their success and last year we had another great meeting at Wheaton College and we're seeing more and more students come to our meetings which is really encouraging and we've often um, honored our 40 year plus members over the last couple of years we've made a tradition of doing that so we've got quite a, an age diversity at the meetings which has been encouraging we're seeing more gender diversity as well and the number of women that are becoming involved and even our engagement with families and spouses. Um, I recall last year I took the spouses to the Billy Graham Center and when I got over to the Billy Graham Center, there were 25 or 30 people waiting for me in the lobby. So it's been neat to see the number of families that are coming to the meetings together. So again, the annual meetings have have been a source of real encouragement for us. Uh, we've talked about the summer something this week. Uh, we've seen about 250 people attend the various events that we've had throughout the week and we expect to see more over the next couple of days. So that's been a, a real encouragement to us as well. In terms of successful members, we've got lots of successful members without a doubt and many of you are established and uh, notable in your fields but we were particularly proud of one of our members this year, as I'm sure you all have heard, Francis Collins was the 2020 Templeton Prize Laureate. Francis is an ASA fellow, a geneticist and a physician, uh, director of the National Institute of Health, and he led the genome project um, successfully. We were blessed to have Francis as a plenary speaker at our Gordon meeting in 2018, and any of you were there uh, witnessed what a fantastic um, presentation. We packed out the chapel at Gordon. It was really a, a blessing to many of us that were there. And Francis, you need to know, is a real ambassador of the ASA. I can't tell you the number of people that we hear from um, as our new members come in um, that have heard of the ASA through Francis' book, The Language of God. So again, he's a real great partner, supporter, and friend, and we're really proud of the fact that he won this award this year. We also have successful scholarship. As you know, the journal is the crown jewel of the organization and has been for a number of years, and you may have read the recent issue on transhumanism. God and Nature is our online e-magazine, and uh, Cy Gard is our editor-in-chief. We'll meet him in a second. And you may have seen the issue that came out Monday on COVID. So God and nature is thriving as well. We had a number of ASA sponsored conferences over the last year. Some of you have participated in those. Um, back in the fall, we had the Canadian American Theological Association Conference out in Rochester at Northeastern Seminary with theologian, Dr. William Brown. Then the Scholarship in Christianity in Oxford program, a number of our members are involved with that. 
and they hosted uh, Mr. Darwin's Tree, which was a one-act play on Darwin at Gordon College, at APU, and a number of other schools. I had the privilege of attending that back in the fall. John did as well. He was here in Boston, and it was fantastic. Um, and ASA partnered on a number of those as well. We also partnered on the COFAS, a lot of acronyms here, and that is the Conference on Faith and Science. And Grand Canyon University, which is one of our local chapters, um, hosted that. They had over 600 in attendance. The year previously, uh, Arizona State University, again, one of our chapters hosted. So it was a second annual event, and of course, you're familiar with the day conferences that take place every year uh, in Southern California. This past year, it was at APU. We also have a great uh, network of partnering organizations, and we're building upon that year by year. Um, many of you are familiar with InterVarsity and Emerging Scholars Network. We've been in partnership with them now for about five years, and Hannah Eagleson is a real uh, ambassador of both organizations, and she has successfully executed the student early career track at the annual meetings, and in fact, we were online earlier today with Hannah and her team because tomorrow is part of the summer something. We're hosting a mini conference uh, with Praveen Sethupathy, and so we have over 100 registered for that. So that's been a real strong partnership of the ASA over the last several years. Uh, of course, BioLogos Foundation is, is a big supporter, and we have a synergistic partnership with them as well. And then Dozer, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, under the umbrella of the AAAS, has been a partner too. And then finally, the Cambridge Roundtable on Science and Religion is a, or another partner organization. We hosted our third annual fellows event on Wednesday, this past Wednesday night. Uh, our first one was here in the Boston area. Last year, we partnered in Wheaton. And this year, we had over 800 in attendance on Wednesday night at a, a virtual event from Ivy Leagues from all over the country. And it was absolutely fantastic uh, on the topic of intellectual humility. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our amazing team. John talked about our team and we are indeed a team and there's a number of people involved that help make the ASA what it is. Um, and so first and foremost, I'm looking this way because as I mentioned to you, I am in the ASA offices, and look who I have with me. I've got Lynn Berg, as you guys all know, uh, and I've worked side by side with Lynn for about eight years. And Lynn is a diehard, she's dedicated, she's loyal, she does whatever it takes to get the job done. And look at Lynn, they're all saying hi to you. That's awesome. So even though we're not at Point Loma and Lynn isn't staying up to the all hours of night letting you oh, in yeah. your rooms, she's, she's keeping long hours helping us execute this. So thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. And then we've got Becky English here, too. <laughs> Becky, come on around. You guys have probably not met Becky face to face, although I'm sure you've talked to her on the phone or via email. Becky is our membership and outreach manager, and she has been with us for about nine months, and she's been a real steady and, and a huge value to the organization and has worked closely with John and I and Dana and some of the others um, here in the office and to execute this um, conference this week, and we're just delighted to have Becky on board. She brings a lot to the table. Hi, <laughs> <I> Alma. <laughs> And then we also have Dana Oleskowitz. Dana is our local chapters coordinator and she uh, works out of Ohio, but she joins us every Monday morning for our staff meeting. She's been on board for about three years and has been a real uh, blessing to us in terms of reaching out to our local chapter uh, members and leaders. I'm sure many of you have interacted with her. So we're delighted to have Dana on board. You're gonna hear from her in a few minutes. The newest member of our team, who is the mastermind behind all of this right here, is Mark 
McEwen. And many of you know Mark. He's been involved with the CSCA, and he's been a godsend for us as we've had to quickly get up the learning curve with Zoom technology, and he's helping with our website. And yet, Mark, I'm seeing some uh, greetings come through for you. So we're, we're glad to have Mark on board. Randy Isaac is still involved with us um, from a distance. He lives here in the Boston area, and he continues to provide support with our IT efforts. And if we have any issues here in the office, he'll, he'll gladly come in and, and take care of any IT or equipment needs. So we're, we're grateful for Randy as well. Uh, Cy Gart is the editor in chief of God and Nature. I mentioned that earlier and his helping hand is his wife, Aniko, who is the uh, managing editor. So they're a, they're a team. Um, we're grateful for them. And of course, Jim Peterson is the um, editor in chief of our journal. And Jim has been a steadfast here at the ASA for a number of years. And we're grateful for him. And underneath Jim is a number of book review editors uh, Steve Kentucky, Sarah Tolsma, Ari Leakwater, Derek Sherman, Malcolm Gold, and Marwin Penner, the newest member of the team. So, uh, those are our team members and we're grateful for all of them. Some of the things that we've been doing over the last three to four minute, months, our, our normal has changed as you can imagine, but we've really focused in on member services and some of the things that we've done uh, include a member phone-a-thon. So immediately we, we thought this would be a great thing as part of our strategy. Um, and so we started a phone-a-thon over the months of April and May. We spent two and a half hours every Wednesday. We came together as a team and we made phone calls uh, to our retired and emeritus members and our 30-year plus members. And over the course of the two months, we made 400 uh, contacts for two purposes, to ask them how they were doing during COVID and how we could be praying for them. And it was just a really valuable time for us. Um, we spent a lot of time praying for them. Um, we gained a lot of insight, member development, feedback. It was really a wonderful time um, for us to, to connect with the members during that um, time frame. Another element of what we've been working on over the last couple of months. And again, with having Becky on board as the membership and outreach manager, uh, we did a deep dive into our constituent group and we focused on who our audience is and how we can best serve them and engage them and how do we provide value to them. So that was a, a valuable experience for us. And out, the outcome of that was a number of focus groups that some of you have been engaged with. Uh, we did a number of chapter chats, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. We took a, a real uh, strong look at our affiliate groups. Our CWIS, uh, Christian Women in Science affiliate, is really thriving right now under the leadership of Lauren Phillips. And they've been meeting quarterly uh, with CWIS Live um, calls. And it's, it's been a wonderful time to connect with the women in the ASA, uh, also under the leadership of Dot Chapel and Janelle Curry. The CSCA, our Canadian affiliate, our partnership with them has become strengthened over the last six months or so. And we're in process now with an MOU with them. And I see that growing over the next uh, few months as well. And then we're going to focus in on our engineering affiliate group and our geologists as well. So these focus groups have been a, a great opportunity for us to get to know our constituents better. In terms of our chapters, our chapters continue to go, grow strong. We uh, started a campaign several years ago, and it's really grown like hotcakes. Um, it started with the Canadians when they had received a Templeton grant several years ago, and they grew from three chapters to 11 in the three-year time frame they had the grant. And then the U.S. chapters have grown as well. So the U.S. chapters total 34, or 24, excuse me, right now. So a total of 35 chapters and about 120 leaders uh, across the U.S. and Canada. And they continue to be the lifeblood of the ASA. 
The other piece of it, as I just mentioned, is our investment in Dana as the local chapter coordinator, and that's really been fruitful and reap dividends for us as well. One of the other things that we um, implemented over the last couple minutes or couple months is a Zoom chapter meeting guide. We quickly realized that we had to become Zoom experts, and I think we have for the most part, although there's a lot to learn about Zoom, and I feel like we're still continually learning little nuances, but we've put out a, a meeting chapter guide to all our chapter leaders to offer them the ability to um, take advantage of the ASA Zoom platform, and a number of chapters have taken advantage of that, and we're scheduling meetings out over the next couple of months, too, with other chapters. I mentioned the chapter chats. That was a brainchild child of Dana. And so over the last three months, we've held four different chapter chats, two for our student chapters, and Dana will talk about that in a minute, and then two for our other chapters. And we had about 40 people engaged uh, representing 20 chapters. So it was a great way to provide updates, gather feedback, facilitate dialogue amongst uh, the chapter leadership. If you're interested in starting a chapter or learning more about chapters, feel free to, to reach out to Dana. Now I'm going to shift gears and talk about uh, the financial update of the organization. We'll look at the ECFA and the seven standards of responsible sh stewardship. ASA has been a member of the ECFA for many years, and essentially it's an accrediting, accrediting agency that provides integrity standards for nonprofits in the area of governance, doctrine, financial management, transparency, and stewardship. We also come under the accrediting body of uh, the IRS and filing of our 990 tax returns. And I want to mention, too, that the ASA a couple of years ago moved to a committee structure where we have a number of working committees uh, that work outside of council meetings and then bring our reports to the council meetings. And so two of those committees are a finance committee and a development committee. So the finance committee obviously is responsible for the finances. So we'll take a look now at the fiscal 20 results and then look at the fiscal 21 budget that John referred to a few minutes ago. So if you look at these charts, um, and as John mentioned, we're coming off a bit of a challenging year where we had a deficit and fell short on our revenue goal and depleted our cash reserves. And I've worked in the nonprofit arena for a number of years for a number of different organizations. And while your goal is always to balance a budget, I have to say in my experience, you periodically I've seen where you have years that you're off and then you use subsequent years to build back up. And that's really a priority for us for this coming year. So taking a look at the fiscal 21 reposition budget and our business model, in April, we had set a budget because we had our council meeting. The budget got set, it got approved, and all of a sudden COVID hit. And so we were back at it, um, repositioning, reconfiguring the budget. And one month later, the council approved a 25% reduction budget, taking into account primarily the, the loss of the annual meeting revenue when we realized our annual meeting uh, got pulled out from underneath us, and also being sensitive to the financial risks of the pandemic from a charitable giving standpoint. So our first order of business was our staff, because the staff is the heartbeat of the organization. And so we immediately applied for the PPP loan, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which comes under the CARES Act. And after two rounds, in the second round of funding, we were able to secure that. So we were really grateful for that, and that's a huge um, element of our budget for this year and us um, being able to maintain the staff. So we're a quarter of the way into the year, and we've been able to keep up with the payroll. 
Now, while we have a challenge before us, we also are optimistic and trusting for God's provision. And in fact, just two nights ago, John and I got an email from one of our members with a really creative suggestion in terms of cost recovery of the COVID impact. Because as it, you've heard me say in the brown baggers, uh, we've chosen uh, we've made a conscious decision not to monetize these meetings this week. Um, but this member said, why don't you take the uh, recovery from the annual meeting that you're looking for and divide it over the number of people that will be attending your events over the course of this week? So I did some quick math on it and I thought, okay, that's about 200 per person. And so if each person were to give just a portion of what they would have paid to go to a meeting, uh, which is about $350, $400, that would help backfill uh, some of this cost recovery that we will be looking to do. So he made a ch challenge gift, um, which I really appreciated. And so I would just ask that you would prayerfully consider joining him. We have had some really excellent success with our development efforts. You'll see this on the chart in front of you. Uh, last year alone, we raised 217,000 in charitable gifts, broken down in a number of categories that you see in front of you with the annual fund, student scholarships, capital fund, memorial fund, an endowment fund. And so our members are really engaged uh, on a much greater level and so we have a lot to be thankful for. The participation rates are up. If you look at the participation rate chart, which again is encouraging to us. And over the course of the last year, we implemented a planned giving program. It's a program that the ASA has never had. And so we took and we built that out. And You'll see here in the chart that we've had a number of gifts that have been giving, given for the endowment fund. And so we're looking to continue our plan giving efforts and building up the endowment. And last year I had talked about at the annual meeting, uh, this legacy campaign idea that we've had. And um, we have a committee in place that's looking at that for the purposes of endowment growth. And we've had some success in a silent phase that we're in the middle of right now. A number of donors have stepped forward and said, we would love to support you in these efforts and seeing our future, our vision for the future in terms of growing the endowment in order to be able to build our programming and operations. And so we're grateful for the number of planned gifts that we have received over the last couple of years. And God has really surprised us in, in amazing ways. I have to say, I witness it on a day-to-day -day basis here in the office. Uh, the number of days that I go to the mailbox and I get the mail and there's a surprise gift in the mail. And he's met our needs at just the right time, right? Never too early, never too late, but always at the right time. And I just want to thank all of you for your generosity and, and faithfulness. Um, over the years and we are really grateful for you and the giving of your time, talent and treasure for the organization. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to John and he's gonna induct our 2020 class of fellows. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, I'm tempted to, to uh, to re, you know, chime in and add some things. There's so much more to this thumbnail sketch that you've gotten and, and, and you took a dive. And the two things I think I'll say is one, in terms of those committees, committees have been invaluable for extending the work of the council and, and taking a really close look at uh, the membership, at uh, development questions, at our finances. Um, we've got a prayer committee. We have, so that, that committee structure is really helping us to, uh, to leverage uh, the task and, uh, and get those done. And then the other thing, I, as you were going through the staff, I'm just smiling because the, my privilege, as I've said to the various committees in the council, it's been my privilege to be part now for the last four months of the Monday morning staff meeting. Uh, 
and to uh, to see the kind of team that we have and we've gotten to know one another on life stories and journeys and certainly we pray for one another but we pray for the members of the asa uh, at those meetings and then do the the planning to lay the week out and uh, vicky leads that and it's been it's really great just to be a part of that and uh, so thank you the class of 2020 fellows this year um what I introduce, we had, and uh, we put before our uh, 187 fellows that we had, we put 12 additional candidates this year, and uh, those candidates were supported across the board. We have a standard, I think it's a, a sort of 50% plus one, just it's, as a kind of standard, and uh, I can tell you that this class was, was way above that, with support, and here are the first six of these individuals who have been, uh, and they're going to join me, and most of them, I think, perhaps all of them, I haven't been able to see the participant list closely, but uh, were all told me that they would be here at our meeting this evening. And so I want to welcome uh, Clay David Carlson, uh, Clay the Trinity Christian UC, um, Carl Fictori, Victory, pardon me, at uh, Dort, and Carl was elected as well. Greg Davidson, Mississippi, and Greg's a, a groundwater geology guy, and we've had lots of fun talking aquatic stuff. You see Fraser Fleming's work there at Drexel. We had a chance to talk with him about uh, publications and the, his, his uh, recent book. And then you see Brian Dick, and Brian is at uh, Colorado State University and a specialist in vocation and calling. You're going to hear more from him. So all of these are leaders. And then uh, Catherine, I think Catherine's with us this evening, Catherine Hayhoe, uh, well-known to the public across the United States and her work in climate change that is continuing and, uh, and, and busy. I know she's working on a book. Then we see here, um, you see Louise. And Louise Wang, who is at uh, Azusa Pacific University, an energetic assistant, as she says, assistant dean at the College of Liberal Arts. I'd like her to be my assistant. She's a, a keener and works hard for us. David Larrabee joins us and uh, as a fellow this year. And we want to welcome David. And he is retired but active and has been active and busy and participating. Uh, Tony Gelsma at Dort, part of the local chapter there, and keeping us uh, functioning in a local chapter function uh, out at, uh, in Iowa. Uh, Rick Lindroth in Madison, Wisconsin, and Rick is an extensive publication. He's a Department of Entomology, so Joe Sheldon's online tonight. Joe, I know you know Rick and his work, because I do too, and I've heard about it. From that entomology training, Say Kim is doing double duty. She has been raised to the level of fellow this year, and we welcome her. And of course, as you know, Say is on our executive council. And then finally, Mark Strand. Mark, welcome from North Dakota State University. I see Mark's smiling face, and I think of him at every meeting that I've, I think I've ever been to. Mark has been there contributing, and we welcome him as a fellow. This is your class of 2020 fellows, and we welcome them all. So now I'm going to turn my attention to 50-year members. And, um, you know, I'm just a young guy in this crowd. I, I'm not even in this crowd. I'm only a 45-year member, which is really interesting when I looked at this, this group because I said, Oh, these are people that I knew about when I joined the ASA back in the uh, mid-70s. And it was really fun to look through the group because I see Harry Cook's name on there, and Harry has been a colleague of mine for a number of years. These are the folks, together we went through fellows who are, are uh, active, and then 50-year members. What a contribution and what a, co uh, a commitment to an organization. Uh, it's not only the value that they've gotten from the ASA, but what they've contributed over the years. And I know many of you, you will look at this list of six individuals and you say, oh, I met them at a meeting. Oh, I've read their paper. Oh, we've talked together. And 
it's it's really um, gratifying. As Vicky reminded me, I looked at this. There's 300 years uh, in the ASA represented right in front of you, and it's one of the things that is deep about this organization: the continuity of our members. We congratulate them. And we pray God's God's blessing on each of our 50-year members. Now I want to turn our attention to a time that we've called sometimes in the past members in glory. And we, we weren't sure quite what to do here. And so we're, we're doing several things. Uh, we have a series of slides that we're going to go through. Uh, this has been a year of transition. If you're a population biologist like I am, you know that uh, the demographic change. And um, so we've tried to think, what do we want to say about each of these individuals, ASA members, colleagues, friends, mentors who have, have passed on. I want to say a little bit and pause it at each one as we make our way through. I want to start and open our time with this verse from 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says to the Corinthians, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a physical body, it is raised in a spiritual body. Each of these individuals we have known and loved, and they participated with us. And we know them in their strengths and in their weaknesses. But we know them primarily as beloved children of God and faithful stewards. We'll take a moment here. Uh, and there have been comments that have come in on each individual. And I will say a, a few things. And we will, we will post those comments. Uh, I've gleaned through them. And I'll say a, a, a few things as we go through. Uh, but... Uh, we're also going to make those. The, uh, Randy has uh, updated the Members in Glory page on the web page, and then we'll say some things. We'll start with Raymond H. Brand. Ray is known to many of us uh, primarily for his years at Wheaton College, but he was uh, also at Westmont, a, a, a scholar, uh, an academic a researcher, and when I think of Ray, I often think of the work that he and Joe Sheldon, Dave Mahan, um, and um, Fred Van Dyke, who've all been members of ASA, did in a, a book on called Redeeming Creation, which is still in print and has had an enormous impact. And Ray was at our meeting, if you were there at the, the Wheaton meeting uh, last year, last summer, I'm sure you took time, as I did, to greet Ray, Ray Brown. George Jamakis Jr. George from California and joined the ASA in the 1960s. Uh, as I talked with Vicki and others, and we got to know what George's contributions uh, have been, in particular, his scholarship, you see there Young's Bible Dictionary, that international uh, standard version of the Bible, uh, a remarkable scholar and making contributions throughout his life. John W. Haas Jr., or Jack, as I'd say we all know him, Jack is and was uh, certainly a fixture in the office and in the work, and his fingerprints are over everything that you see here that we're doing. Um, there's so much that can be said, and in fact, we have large tributes to uh, giants like Jack that will be that Randy and others have written, and they will be uh, in our newsletters and posted. Bob Herman. Bob's contribution 
is one of those uh, consolidators of our mission in his role as the executive director. You see him joining the ASA early and his, his work at, uh, in academia, but most importantly is our uh, transition ASA executive director there from 1981 to 1994. And especially his work with the Templeton Foundation because it turned out that uh, Bob was uh, uh, wintering, I think it was, in the Bahamas, and he went over and talked to his neighbor. It turned out to be a, some guy named John Templeton. And they struck up a conversation. And that was a, uh, that was a change moment in the face science community. Uh, the, the world turned in, uh, on that conversation. So John Templeton had been doing some writing, and Bob helped him out with that writing, and he did some, some editing on that, and they struck up a conversation and a friendship that blossomed into five books, and the work of the Templeton Foundation that uh, and Bob's fingerprints are all over that. And so God has blessed his work, uh, certainly in that way. And you will be hearing more from us as we think of, of ways to honor his memory. Paul Lipsy, out of Seattle. He joined the ASA in 87, and you see there he's a professor, was a professor of chemistry at Seattle Pacific. He attended meetings, but interestingly, as I was looking down the comments that came in, one came in from a colleague of mine, uh, Karen Steensma. And it turns out that Karen was in Paul's classes, chemistry classes. And then I think the greatest honor that you can pay to a chemistry professor is to have a biologist, a non-chemistry major, <laughs> say, I really learned chemistry from this person. And that's what, what Karen was saying. Uh, just loved the way that Paul taught and cared for his students. Paul Lips. I don't think Don Monroe needs to be introduced to many, and, and we were all saddened with Don's passing this last year. Vicki had an opportunity to talk with him uh, not uh, too many months before he passed away with he and his wife. Uh, Don, I knew because he turned out to be a mentor for me. In the mid-80s, we were in a, a joint seminar at the Calvin uh, Center for a Christian Scholarship and uh, spent three wonderful weeks there. And Don stepped in on you know, his retirement from Houghton. He stepped in as our executive director. He had been on the executive council. He's been a program chair. And then you see his decade of service to us in a, in a critical way. I'm noticing in the chats, too, that there are comments from individuals, and thank you for doing that, uh, your individual personal comments, and we can all share those and read those, so please do that. Don W. Monroe. Roger G. Rowe. Roger is uh, in geology. It seems to me I remember meeting him because he looks so familiar to me, but uh, I'm guessing that, that Steve Mosier and, uh, and uh, other people, Jeff Greenberg and other geologists in our group, uh, know Roger better than, than I did. Um, and I see here that he's a, what was a geologist with Exxon Mobil, and you know that the geologists with Exxon Mobil, you know what they're doing. They're peering into the earth on a treasure hunt. And, uh, so we remember Roger G. Rowe. Earl H. West, North Carolina, joining in 1953. And he was at Lipscomb University. He was a chemistry teacher there, but also dean in the School of Education, or associate dean, pardon me, in the School of Education, and uh, executive assistant to their vice president of academic affairs, and had a large fingerprint and a large impact on students at, and faculty at Lipscomb University, Earl H. West. James Wiley Jr., a chemist and teacher from Orange Coast College and um, 
interesting looking at his life story. You see there he spoke Japan, Japanese and remarkable because of his experience with uh, the Japanese uh, during the, the Second World War and right after and his knowledge of that language. And he used that in a very interesting way with his chemistry students. So you just put Japanese characters on your unknowns. And I can see him stumping a number of uh, undergraduates at that point. He also was active in, his, in the Presbyterian Church, uh, played piano for years, and made a number of other contributions. James Wiley, Jr. For our members in glory, Lord, hear our prayer. Let me close with these words from our Lord. And for those of you who were at a loss in figuring out what was happening, Jesus told them to lay down their questions and relax. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. The Lord is receiving these, his servants, into his arms. For our members in glory, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Good evening. It is my privilege to introduce the leaders from our four ASA student chapters. As Vicki mentioned earlier, we are being intentional and very strategic in how we reach out to students for recruitment and engagement. Students can be very effective as advocates on college campuses for generating new ASA members. And they also are the leaders, future leaders for our organization. We certainly welcome their participation. First, from the Colorado Christian University chapter, we are pleased to introduce Julie Woodman as the faculty advisor with Jonathan Bleacher, Anna Duncan, and Kyla Saunders as student leaders. CCU often works with our veteran Rocky Mountain chapter in producing seminars. Thank you for offering such a strong local partnership. From Gordon College, Angie Cornwall produced provides the leadership as the faculty advisor. Student leaders for this chapter include Serafina Zotter, Miranda Pomfret, Caitlin Kwok, and Michael Hahn. This student group is another example of a crossover relationship in joint programming with the ASA Boston chapter. The University of Georgia student chapter is brand new. We recently introduced them in an ASA newsletter. Fritz Schaefer is their faculty advisor. Mark Wolf, as a student leader, was one of the authors of our daily devotionals this week. He is joined by John David Adams and Nathan McVeigh to round out this Georgia chapter. And finally, the Grand Canyon University student chapter is led by Daisy Savarajan as the faculty advisor, with Ramesh Velapalamini and Jacob Lotti as student leaders. This chapter has been instrumental in offering a very successful conference on faith and science in Phoenix, Arizona for the past couple of years. On behalf of our organization, I wish to thank all for providing the local leadership through our student chapters. And now I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Veronica Franz will be offering us a student testimonial. Welcome, Veronica. My fellow ASA members, I'm here not just to introduce myself, but to say thank you. So I'm going to start with that. Thank you so, so much. I'm a PhD student at Michigan State University doing a dual PhD in fisheries and wildlife and ecology, evolutionary biology, and behavior. Um, I've done a lot in my life to get here. I've lived, worked, and studied abroad in nine different countries. I've battled over 800 days in the roughness and toughness of Alaska's waters, 
and I can even speak six languages. However, these experiences and qualities are all on the surface of who I am. They're impressive to many, but as Paul pretty much says, I can do all these things, but if I do it without love, I am nothing. And as James says, um, if I have works without faith, I, these are also nothing. Um, coming from Spanish Harlem, New York, and knowing the iniquities of my past generations, maybe I wasn't supposed to be here, but I am because of faith and love. When I went to Messiah College for my undergrad, the challenges of school made me feel like I didn't belong. But it was at Messiah that I met my first ASA member, Dr. Joseph Sheldon. Many of you may know Joe and how great he is. He's the first person in my life outside my family who truly believed in me. Despite the things I lowered my self-esteem about, Joe accepted me for who I was and saw the future person God wanted me to be. So for over 15 years, this one ASA member had an incredible impact in my life. And this is just one person. So you can imagine the impact ASA has had on me since my first meeting that I went to last year alone, right? <laughs> um, my first year in graduate school was tough. Imposter syndrome, loneliness, competition, sleeplessness, depression. These are all highly contagious in the toxic atmosphere of academia. How can I be a light when such darkness is so suffocating? I admit that this darkness took over me by the time I finished my first year of school. But then I went to my first ASA meeting. It was then that the light within me was able to shine again. I felt so safe, welcomed, inspired, and my hope was restored. I learned that there are many influential scientists in their fields who made it with their, with their faith and wisdom ever increasing despite it all. I learned to not just study a subject, but to find awe and wonder in it, which naturally leads to praise and thankfulness. I learned that it's okay to have uncertainty from time to time. And most importantly, I learned that I was not alone. In this COVID-19 situation, the darkness of graduate school and academia was added again. But what I learned from ASA was not fleeting. Every month, the Christian Women in Science group has been meeting via Zoom. And despite living alone, working alone, thinking alone, I am not alone. ASA has had and will always have a lasting impact in my life. From one member and mentor like Joe to interacting with more ASA members than I can even count now, I am so comforted and happy to be a part of the ASA family that it is. This is a family I didn't know I had and didn't know I needed. I'm so grateful to grow and learn from you all, and I hope to be able to pay it forward as I help new students and early career members who may be stuck or with doubts like I was. There's so much more I want to say, uh, but I know I have the rest of my life with ASA to say it. So for now, it's just great to meet you all, and again, Thank you so, so much for taking me in, uplifting me, and supporting a member like me. I have been asked by the staff if I would be willing to talk about the Student Scholarship Fund and about the importance of ASA members supporting it. And I want to start by just sort of saying to everybody, besides good evening and hello, how do you feel now? I know how I feel after hearing Veronica's statement. Um, Veronica, thank you so much. It was such an inspiration to hear about your experience and about how you feel about ASA and about how mentoring in it has been so important to you. Um, Vicki asked me if I would come on for a few minutes to talk about uh, why I make contributions to the Student Scholarship Fund. And there are two main reasons. One is personal, and the other one is organizational. The personal reason uh, is because of what you just heard Veronica tell you about her experience, because mine is very similar. And at many stages during my career development, uh, from high school 
through college, and even in graduate school, there are many opportunities that I couldn't, I would not have had. I wasn't able to uh, financially, uh, you know, the cost could be a barrier. Or, and in those cases, God blessed me that there was always someone, often who I didn't know, who made a donation that made it possible for me to have things in my training that otherwise I would not have had. And so for that reason, every chance I'm able to, I make donations to student scholarship funds. Now, the organizational reason uh, is because what you just heard isn't an investment in the ASA. God's blessing to teachers are students. And many of us who are in this organization, I being a very new member, are teachers. But you can see what kind of vibrancy and vitality having young scientists thinking about God and how he is in their lives and in their science is so important to what this organization is about. So by by giving donations to the Student Scholarship Fund, we make an investment in our future. We make an investment in the future of young scientists who are coming along with us. And we bring a real virus, vibrancy to this organization. And it helps us to meet our mission in the world uh, in terms of what ASA is by the way that we support young people. So I hope all of you will have a if you haven't been making contributions, start making contributions to the scholarship fund. And those of you who are will continue that work because it's a very important part of what this organization is about. So thank you for, and for the opportunity to talk to you about this important aspect of ASA. Thank you very much, Veronica and James. I've enjoyed getting to know both of you, and Veronica, we're delighted to have you as part of the family and as part of the CWIS group. And James, thank you so much for your uh, support of the organization on many levels, including giving to the Student Scholarship Fund. We have some upcoming meetings that we want to tell you about. Uh, in the wake of the Summer Something series, we're planning another member assembly meeting, similar to the one we did in April. On October 16th and 17th, we're going to do the Friday night and Saturday, again with Brian Dick, who is a new fellow of the ASA, and Brian is involved with career and calling at Colorado State University. Uh, his primary discipline is vocational psychology, and he uses science to investigate career development and work as a calling. So we're delighted to have Brian join us in the fall. We're going to continue the brown bag lunches. I mentioned those earlier. James was actually um, a brown bag lunch speaker yesterday, and we had Audrey Bowden on Tuesday. Uh, both of them were plenary speakers at previous annual meetings, so we repurposed those and brought both of them in live. They were great opportunities to come together. We had over 60 people on each of those meetings, and so we're planning to do that on a monthly basis. Additionally, uh, our prayer committee meets quarterly. We had a wonderful start to this week, Monday, with about 40 people on our prayer and praise meeting. So any of you that are interested in joining us and praying for the ASA, praying for each other as members. Please plan to join us. We're thinking toward a regional day conference later in January. We have January 30th earmarked. And what we're envisioning is something similar to the Southern Cal Day Conference. And we're, we'd be looking to replicate this around the US and Canada. Thinking eight, 10, 12 chapters would come together in a regional format and we would provide leadership from the home office. We would live stream a plenary, yet we would give flexibility to the individual chapters to customize what their day might look like. So stay tuned for details on that. We're excited about that, and hopefully that can become a reality for us. And then in terms of next summer, our current plan is to roll over what would have been our meeting at Point Loma Nazarene this week completely rolling over the program to next summer. 
obviously there's a lot of unknowns at this stage of the game, but stay tuned and we'll keep you updated in terms of what our planning is for next summer. Now we're gonna go to a time of Q&A and John and I will tag team this. I'm looking to see if John is back on. I am. I am Vicki and I've unmuted. I'm ready to go. In fact, we have a couple of, of questions. I see at least three questions have come into the chat already. And uh, I just, just take those uh, as we go. And uh, I'll answer uh, uh, many of these and uh, Vicki will, uh, will chime in or I'll hand some off to her as we go. So the first question that came in uh, was on details of the council terms, the uh, council membership. Uh, this comes from former council member and President Lynn Billman. Uh, Lynn, you, you said you saw eight people there who will be on the, uh, on the council going forward. Did anyone go off in March and, uh, of, uh, this year, of this year? And who will go off in this next year? And uh, so that's a great question. In fact, um, if I'd been on my toes, Judy Taranchuk, I think, is at the meeting this evening. And Judy, we want to give a shout out to you and thank you so much for your service on the council. Uh, you stepped in to uh, fill a term that uh, was a partial term, and, and we had two Canadians on our council at the same time, which is probably unheard of in our history, and uh, maybe why we have such good relationships with CSCA right now. So, But uh, Judy, uh, Judy, thank you so much for your service. So Judy went off uh, on this, this last March, and uh, as we had the three new council members come on, and then my term uh, is up in, uh, at the end of this, uh, at this year, so in 2021. That was a decision that was taken inside the council. We had to interpret these. That's why I put the five-year and the three-year terms up there. We had a conversation about that and we, in council, and the feeling was that there was, uh, the bylaws were open in this transition period, and the feeling was that these five-year members should finish our terms and go off the council at the end of that normative term, and that we would then be just bringing on uh, new three-year members. I was going to add to that, there's an interesting dynamic that's happening on council. We've expanded the number, uh, which is interesting, and it creates more diversity, age, and uh, it's open it up to non-fellows as well. So we get age and disciplinary differences. We're trying to think that. But this three-year term means that we're going to have more turnover on the council. And that's the council has been turning its attention then to, I mentioned, uh, orientation of new council members and uh, the number of meetings and face-to-face. -face. We've instituted this last uh, January, a retreat, uh, which was really a non-business uh, uh, day where we could just focus in on some really deep thinking questions and get to know one another better. So we're, we're looking structurally to figure out how we're going to, to uh, be the most effective council we can be going forward. And I can tell you so far, I think it's working very well. Second question that came in was, can you say a little more about the member assembly? Uh, what was it like? What did I miss uh, on that April? And so I'm going to turn this to Vicki and let her say some things about the member assembly and the possibility of uh, catching that online. Vicki? Yeah, thanks, John. Yes, our member assembly from April is online. So if you go to the website, the homepage, you'll see a, um, a square in there that has the details. You click on that and you'll be able to see it live. And like I mentioned earlier, we're planning to replicate that um, in October. So we did a 7 p.m. Eastern time Friday night and we'll repeat it again Saturday at noontime. And we thought that was a good opportunity for people that weren't able to, to catch the Friday night, to catch the Saturday. And we had about 100 people on each mm -hmm. one. So we'll plan for a similar format uh, in October. That was great, Vicki. And, and one of the things there is the content of that was uh, we had uh, a doctor, medical doctor, John Pohl, one of our members in Utah. He's a pediatric uh, surgeon. Uh, and specializes on pancreatic cancer. He and his wife were uh, doing overtime work on uh, 
with the COVID in those early days. And John gave us a wonderful little update and overview of both the technical side of the COVID questions and then the personal side of how that influences him as a uh, frontline medical uh, provider. Uh, and then we also had uh, Patrick Franklin. And if you've not heard Patrick's story, Patrick is a, a member of, uh, from the CSCA, uh, lives in the uh, Waterloo, Kitchener-Waterloo area, just to the west of Toronto. And um, his, um, he's also been a member of the executive council for the CSCA, who's on their executive. And Patrick, uh, as Arnold Sikama has kicked in the line here, Patrick's the president on leave of CSCA, is his, his title. His story from uh, just shortly, just weeks after our meeting in, in Wheaton, Patrick suffered uh, on a Sunday evening a massive coronary failure. And in the, a matter of a, a space of a few minutes to a few days, was revived multiple times. And it, uh, their blog site and his story is uh, a powerful uh, of what God is doing in the life of, of Patrick Franklin, a professor at uh, Tyndall uh, University College in Toronto, professor of theology there, and a former pastor and has a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a remarkable story. So pick it up again, our member assembly. Uh, so that now a technical question on the meeting next year. Uh, interesting. Will there be a possibility for new abstracts to be submitted? Yes. In fact, uh, we will be picking up the planning committee uh, is uh, in hiatus now, but here in the fall, uh, they, the planning committee will come back together. The idea is, and we haven't worked out any of that detail yet, as you can imagine, but we'll be do, do something because we know we're going to have some abstracts go and we may get some new ones submitted. And so there's going to be a conversation. So stay tuned for that. It's likely to happen. Um, I don't think it'll happen before January. I think we're going to probably push it a little bit late because the major backbone of the program is already established. And we really want to see what's happening with COVID. And uh, as you, you all know, this is such a dynamic environment that we're in. Um, so we're, again, thrown into the world of planning two possibilities here of a face-to-face -face or what do we do a year from now if, if we're uh, left in an online environment. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we'll be having. Stay tuned on that. And how do we join the prayer meeting? Vicki, uh, Zoom time address, uh, can you forward uh, that information? I can do that, Fred. So my, I'm running down low here. Is it compulsory that members have a background in the sciences, in science, to be eligible to hold office? An interesting technical question about uh, the membership. Um, in the natural and social sciences. And Steve Moser and Terry Gray are, are and uh, Johnny Lynn are our constitution and bylaws experts. And I'm having brain fog at this stage of the day and week. Um, and so I'm looking here to see if somebody's going to kick in an answer in the, in the chat line to all of us on that. And Ruth Douglas Miller says, we've had people without science degrees specifically in the past on council. And I think I'm trying to remember it. It's all sort of slowly working here. And John, I, John so, I can help. Yeah, Vicki can help. Thank you. Yeah, because of the new change in the bylaws, um, we now are um, allowed to have non-fellows that serve on the council. That's and right. non-fellow would be somebody that would potentially not have a a science degree. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly right. Now I wonder I, if, if uh, Becky saw any other questions that I have missed. I, it niggles me that there was one that went past earlier that I missed. 
There was one on the, the chat, John, it, that asked about the challenge that I had talked about. They said, are you, are you saying the $200 challenge makes up the annual meeting shortfall? Right. And yes, that's what I was saying, that if 250 people that were joining us this week each chipped in 200 bucks, that would help make up the shortfall of our loss of revenue from the annual meeting. I hope that clarifies. Yeah, I, I might want to just, I, I should speak into this a little bit. I didn't say it in my general report, but <clears throat> this is a challenging time for every nonprofit, and I have had the chance to be online and, and talking on phone and with different executive directors from different organizations. One organization that's, uh, uh, you know, close to many of us and, and, and participated in, uh, has seen its business model turned upside down, and uh, their ex executive director, uh, they've had to reduce their staff, and, uh, and their executive director has moved on, they've reduced their staff. Other ones, uh, I was talking with uh, uh, Luke Wilson here at Arosha Canada today, we had a conversation, and uh, he was looking at this model too, and so we're all trying to think about what is the trajectory? Where is this going? So the uncertainty that we feel as individuals, organizations are feeling as well. And so our commitment here is, is to our mission and to member service. And we, you know, on the, on the staff and the management side and the council deeply appreciate the support that is coming in and continue to pray that, that the Lord would give us uh, wisdom in the choice of ideas and, and uh, you know, how we position ourselves uh, in the faith science uh, space out here. I was thinking back to when in the 1940s when we got started, there were a handful of organizations. And today, uh, there are literally tens, if, if not hundreds of organizations uh, out in that space. So, uh, and, and we're well aware uh, of the of the challenges, but we're also again celebrating the fact that God has been faithful and continues to be faithful, and we uh, we want to thank all of you for your prayer and for your generous support. Do we have any other questions? I think. Oh, Terry put in the details, and there it is, and we will post that later because it's too much to read. I think at the poem. Thank you, Terry. Well, if there's no further questions, I'll talk about the remaining events that we have planned for the week. Immediately following this, we are going to have our famous ice cream social. And I hope all of you have your favorite ice cream ready to join us. I've got my Cherry Garcia, Ben and Jerry's here. You'll find a link in the chat function. So you click on the link and that will bring you into the ice cream social and I will meet you there. Uh, after that, tomorrow I mentioned the mini conference uh, with Emerging Scholars Network in the ASA starting at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. If you haven't registered and want to register, it's not too late. You find all the details online. Immediately following the mini conference, ladies, Grab your glass of wine or your iced tea and join us for the SeaWiz after party. And then wrapping up the week on Sunday morning, we're going to have uh, an ASA style worship service. As many of you know, it's the can be the highlight of our annual meetings. And uh, we have Dr. Sean McDonough, who's a New Testament scholar at Gordon Conwell Seminary, joining us. We're going to have a ch children's sermon. We're uh, featuring music from Jonathan Ogden from United Kingdom, who will also uh, present tomorrow at the mini conference. And we also have a special video montage. So please join us, bring your family and friends and uh, join us at 12 noon Eastern uh, Sunday morning. And then immediately following that, we will have a coffee hour as well. So it's been a wonderful evening. I've really enjoyed all the chat going on. It's, it's been wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And even though we can't be there, 
in person. It's been a delight to be with you here online.